welcome everybody. My name is Garth Johnson. I am the Everson Museum of Arts Paul Phillips and Sharon Sullivan Curator of Ceramics and I'm delighted for only the second time since the start of the pandemic to be actually broadcasting live from the museum. Uh, so I now have access to objects from the museum collection um, and that is bringing me some small comfort as well. So I'm going to introduce our special guest for today and then do a little bit of housekeeping, make some announcements and talk about some of the history of the Everson and teapots. Uh, but our special guest today, and she has many of her friends in the virtual room with us, is someone that I know and love as one of my favorite people, Karen Selwyn. So Karen, say hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> So I was, I was really happy to come into my position at the Everson a little bit under two years ago uh, and to know that the Everson had a relationship with Karen. Uh, she spends a lot of the year in Rochester and together with her husband, Philip, who passed away last year, uh, they have embarked on this collecting odyssey. And uh, it was really my privilege to get to know um, Philip and uh, Philip and Karen helped to make my uh, entry here at, in the Everson um, a sort of happy and seamless one in a lot of ways. Karen collects a lot of the artists that uh, I value. So there, here was an instant um, introduction and pipeline to a lot of contemporary artists that I value. Um, so we're going to be talking to Karen about her own history with collecting. We're going to be talking with uh, the artist Eric Saratella, who actually has some great roots here in central New York. And we are going to, for the first time ever, be doing a bit of taped sorcery. So Karen and I earlier today had a conversation with the artist Krista Assad, who couldn't be with us live, but we wanted her voice to be heard. All right, I'm going to show a few slides. Uh, and as I do, I want to encourage everybody to look on the upper right hand corner of your screen. And you can see that you can switch from speaker view uh, or from gallery view, which shows you a Brady Bunch variety of squares of everyone who's watching. And I do encourage you to share your video here on the screen. Um, but please stay on mute. But if you switch between uh, the gallery view and speaker view, you'll be able to see our image bigger. Both Karen and I are going to be actually getting teapots and showing them for our cameras. And plus you want to see our beautiful faces as well. So please switch to speaker view if you, if you can. Also maybe go full screen. Uh, that's gonna help you uh, enjoy and appreciate the images even more. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and show a few more slides. I also want to encourage you to use the chat function and say hello from wherever you are. We do archive the chats. And if you'd like to ask questions or get our attention in some way, do that via the chat function. And we're going to have the ability to take some questions. And we can even bring you on um, live to ask your question. But any comments, any questions, any greetings that you want to do, use that chat feature. So today is. The observance, uh, the observance of Juneteenth here at the Everson Museum. And I'm happy to say that not only am I broadcasting from the Everson Museum, but that the Everson Museum is participating in Juneteenth programming. Um, the recent protests that have erupted in Syracuse and all over the nation, the protesters here in Syracuse are using the Everson as one of the protest hubs. There are chalk messages to the community throughout our plaza. And many of our employees are gathered at a socially safe distance with masks today to help register voters. Um, we have masks available for the public. We have sidewalk chalk available. Uh, we are making buttons. So if you are in Syracuse, feel free to come, come join us and get a sense of the community of the museum. And uh, if you are not here in Syracuse, then um, I'm glad that you're joining us as we both celebrate and reflect on the occasion of Juneteenth. Uh, you can go to the Everson's website. Uh, yesterday would have been the Everson's annual fundraising picnic, which is the biggest event in the Everson's social calendar. The fundraiser was canceled, and so we were not having the picnic in person. 
but there is a beautiful video that calls attention to the Eversons uh, awardees and medalists, including Dr. Paul Phillips and his wife, Sharon Sullivan, who are the donors that made my position possible. And they are endowing the ceramic gallery and my position in perpetuity. Their gift was close to $5 million, which is certainly the largest gift that was ever given uh, to the museum. So Paul, Sharon, uh, you are well-deserving of the Everson Medal and we celebrate it with you here today. Uh, go to the Everson's website. You can find out about our virtual programming. You can see messages from our director and our board chair, and you can learn what the Everson is doing uh, during the pandemic to stay connected to our community. You can also find our ceramic database. So go to everson.org and go to exhibitions. And under that, you can find our ceramic database and you can use it to research the many teapots that are in our collection, the artists who participated in the ceramic national exhibitions. And you can find out a lot about the Everson's history there. So please pay us a visit on the web. I'm gonna put in one more big plug for something that's coming up and it also involves the Everson. The gallerist Jeffrey Spahn has put together an incredible benefit auction that is going to be starting on eBay tonight, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to feature more than 300 works from artists from all around the world, and it's going to benefit the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. And if you don't know the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, it is a vital, vital nonprofit that puts money in the hands of artists when they have emergencies. Uh, Krista Assad, who is going to be joining us later via tape, had a life-threatening injury over five years ago when her house caught fire and she had to jump out of a top floor. She broke her back very severely and the Craft Emergency Relief Fund was one of the ways that she was able to keep afloat. It helped her with her medical expenses and she is now making pots and a part of the ceramic community again, partially thanks to the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. There are museum quality pieces. There are incredible teapots that are a part of this auction. And I'm happy to say that next week on Thursday, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm gonna be hosting a virtual cocktail party to kick off the uh, final days of the auction. And we will be wel welcoming the director of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. We will be directing uh, uh, welcoming uh, some people who set the auction up, including Jeffrey Spawn. We'll be welcoming artists and collectors and gallerists who are donating to the cause. And all of the money that's raised will go to the hands of artists. And they have earmarked half of the funds for this auction to go to artists of color and underserved uh, artists. So um, please, uh, watch the Everson social media for the Craft Emergency Relief Fund auction. Several artists have donated pieces, including Peter Pincus, that part of the proceeds will go to the Everson directly. So some of the proceeds are being split between the Craft Emergency Relief Fund and other causes, but it is an amazing and a worthy cause. So join, join me on Thursday for that virtual cocktail party. Um, and I just wanted to show one image from uh, of many of the pieces that are in that exhibition. This is the Polish artist and designer, uh, Mark Czechula, uh, Marek Czechula, and uh, um, uh, his sense of design and community engagement are almost second to none. And we're lucky to have a couple of incredible pieces by Marek in that exhibition. Um, very quickly, I thought that I would zip through a few of the teapots that grace the Everson's collection. The Everson does have historic pieces in our collection of Staffordshire teapots. We have uh, 20th century um, teapots by uh, designers from Hallcraft and other industrial designers who worked in ceramics. But I want to harken back to the Ceramic Nationals, which were the largest most prestigious juried exhibition uh, when it came to the ceramics community. They started at the Everson in 1932 and they ran through 1972. And through that, we were able to collect the work of a lot of young artists early in their career, which is something that Karen Selwyn very much does. And I'm gonna be talking to her about that. Um, so this is an incredible uh, pot, um, a tea set from Marguerite Wildenhain, the California artist. Uh, she was trained by the Bauhaus. She moved to the United States and she wound up 
setting up her own pottery in a rural area in California and teaching generations after generations of students. And this piece dates from 1946, so just after World War II. And this was an incredible watershed moment for the Ceramic Nationals when they really came into their own. Um, this is an incredible stoneware piece. She would later use a lot of native clays from Pond Farm, the area that she worked in. Um, this has multiple cups uh, along with the creamer and sugar. So you're just seeing a small piece of the collection. Another piece, which is one that I've highlighted in weeks past, this is the artist Mini Nagoro. So a Japanese artist who was placed in an internment camp during World War II. Um, she met the Alfred uh, ceramic artist, Dan Rhodes, and was mentored by him. And this piece was featured in the Ceramic Nationals only two years after the end of World War II. And the Everson was among the different um, uh, organizations in the ceramic community that helped to uh, build Mini Nagoro's amazing career. And she is revered uh, as an artist today. Um, a few random pots that I plucked up from images in our collection. Uh, we are celebrating Pride Month this month and uh, queer artists um, have literally built a lot of the ceramic field and it is evident across the Everson's collection. We are fortunate enough to own several pieces by an artist who was a mentor to me um, and is very important to the Everson, Mr. Matt Nolan. And this is a Matt Nolan teapot that I feel is one of the most important pieces of his career. Uh, it's gigantic. I think it probably um, stands about 22 inches tall. And this is called the testosterone teapot. And so you can see that uh, there are all of these images of men playing rough and tumble sports. There is a Playboy bunny uh, on the finial of the teapot. And you have some camouflage tank guns, not so subtly coming out of the front of the teapot. Um, it is a monumental uh, teapot in more, more ways than one. Um, I also wanted to point out while I'm on the subject of pride that next Friday's, um, uh, I'm, so I'm not gonna host this cocktail party and be lazy the day after. We're gonna be celebrating pride by um, speaking about the work of pioneering ceramic artist, Sasha Brastoff. Uh, for whom we have important pieces in the Everson's collection. Um, important queer uh, ceramic artist, um, cross-dresser, uh, cabaret artist uh, of note. Um, and we are going to celebrate Sasha Brastoff's life and career. And we'll be doing that with one of the last executors of his estate, Steve Conti, uh, who lives in Los Angeles. So look forward to that conversation very quickly on the subject of pride. Uh, this is the clay, uh, gay clay teapots, uh, a series of two teapots by the artist Tom McKenna. Um, lots of iconography, um, sort of dedicated to coded messages that get sent out within the ceramics world uh, among queer artists and uh, names of important queer potters and ceramic artists sort of cover the piece, pieces in uh, various spots. Um, incredible Warren McKenzie teapot from our collection. So the Everson's um, teapot collection ranges from the sculptural and I hate the word whimsical, but um, the uh, functional adjacent, shall I say, to hardcore functional pieces by noted potters like Warren McKenzie. So this Warren McKenzie pot is a treasured, treasured piece from the collection uh, that was donated by uh, friends of Warren's in his name, I think uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, Peter Shire, the Cobra artist, has incredible pieces in the Everson's collection. This is the accordion donut teapot from 1984. Um, Kim Dickey. Uh, she is an artist who adeptly combines her love of the natural world, uh, performance, politics, uh, her studies into medieval ceramics and iconography, um, and is someone that I've been actively working to bring to the Everson's collection. But this was a piece that was donated by the Everson's Social Art Club. 
Um, we're fortunate enough also to have one of Richard Notkin's Yixing cube uh, skull pots. And today we'll be talking about a range of teapots that uh, take a social message or uh, some bit of information and wrap it in the functionality of the teapot or the celebration of the teapot in, able to, uh, in order to present it to the audience. Um, the Everson has pots from across many different eras. So this is a pot that Karen and Philip Selwyn uh, donated to the Everson. Um, one of my very favorites, and this is the work of Steve Howell. This teapot dates to about 1985. And I firmly believe that uh, the iconography of the 1980s is back on the rise after, I don't know, being less than prominent for quite a while. And we're able to see it with fresh eyes uh, for what it is. And I find the um, exuberance and the wildness and the color of this teapot um, to be incredibly stimulating. And it is currently on view at the Everson uh, in an exhibition. And we should be open to the public um, again uh, in a little bit over a month, I believe. We're taking it day by day here. But I would invite you to come look at the selection of more than 17 pots from Karen and Philip that are on the on exhibition right now in the exhibition, A Legacy of Firsts. Um, the final teapot that I will mention today before we start chatting with Karen and bring Eric, uh, Eric Saratella into the conversation uh, is by an artist who's very important to me. Uh, Malcolm Davis, Davis was uh, an Episcopal priest and a civil rights activist of note. Um, he, I think, is the only artist in the Everson's collection who was literally on Nixon's enemies list. Um, and he really transitioned um, from his direct street activism. You better not leave. <laughs>
Yeah, I know. The, the, Eric is my son, and the only connection he has to this talk is that when he was learning to walk and we hadn't realized how good he was at making his way around the house by holding on to furniture, he sent a gorgeous, gorgeous um, Robin's Egg Blue El Serrati flying. Um, but okay, enough about him. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Let me do one other bit of housekeeping. I'm going to attempt to go live on Facebook again. Okay. Uh, Aaron, I'll let you um, entertain. I had asked the question about uh, talking about your house, which is, uh, I would say, a real art environment. It's really uh, dedicated to uh, showing off your collection in this uh, um, wonderful way in Rochester. Um, it, it is. Um, the house was bought, we've been in this house seven years, and um, at that point we knew the, um, the collection was um, well over a hundred pieces. Uh, I'd already given away um, maybe as many as 50 pieces, but, but what was left was over 100. And um, the house was chosen in large part because it could display the art in a coherent way. And my husband, um, who's a scientist, by, who was a scientist by training, um, had more fun designing the lighting system uh, for the uh, display cases we put in strips of little LED lights and we had to um, decide on the, the strength. You know, the LED lights have numbers to them and that indicates how white the light is or how yellow the light is. And we were debating between um, uh, any pieces that are glazed with cool tones look better with a clear or white and glazes that skew greens and yellows um, and browns to go better with slightly yellow light. Well, my collection was far too eclectic. And so um, my husband said, can we alternate lights? And they looked at him first like he was crazy. And then they thought, no, no, there's no reason why you can't. We're just going to um, have to specially construct the, the lighting that we, we put in. And, and they did, and they even gave it a name, not by Philip's name, but they called it salt and pepper lighting. And um, it's now one of their standard offerings. But Philip had unbelievable fun figuring out the size and dimensions of the trapezoids that we would put in the corners on which to attach these strips of lighting so that the beams from both directions would cross in the center and there'd be no, no shadow being cast from one shelf down to the shelves below or one piece to its left or another piece to its right. He had a huge, huge, huge amount of fun and was very, very, very proud of, of the setup that he had. I'm, I'm not an envious person by nature, Karen, but when I went to visit you and I got to see all of the uh, teapots and the way that they were displayed, uh, the, the Everson is a you know historic brutalist building by I.M. Pei, but he was not an, a lighting designer and certainly not one who was designing for uh, the showing of small ceramic objects. So I, I really wish that uh, I had the capacity to be able to show uh, work here at the Everson in the way that you were able to show it in your own home. It's it's fun and it's um, well, it's a great testament to Philip. So I, I want to back up a little bit and not to get to um, curator pretentious here. Um, I love to think about the way that the market worked uh, with teapots in particular and the journey that you've taken as a collector. I think really dovetails in a perfect way with the rise of um, the craft, the craft gallery, um, the rise of artists being able to seek higher pr price points, um, you know, versus just showing at uh, um, craft shows or selling at farmers markets and things like that. Uh, 
Can, can you talk a little bit about that and where you were when you sort of came into your own as, um, as a collector? Yes, it's definitely been a journey. Um, back in the mid seventies, I took a year off from teaching English. And um, I went back to George Washington University to study art. I always loved it as a high school student, um, but I, I never did anything with it. And uh, I wanted a year off from teaching. And so I went to GW and I took um, the usual assortment of classes. And it was not a completely successful year. In the decades since I was more actively making art, um, the old hand-to-eye coordination had um, uh, gotten quite rusty, is the way to put it. And, um, but what I discovered, uh, I who had never had any experience um, with ceramics, was happiest in the ceramics lab. I studied under a professor named Turker Ozdegan, who was Turkish and um, quite a character. And he, um, he really, really inspired me. And when, after an incident in, in a design class where we were supposed to uh, portray our, uh, display our portfolios on a given day and I was like getting totally overwhelmed and didn't think I was gonna make it. Um, and I went to the professor and asked if I could have a one day extension and he just, pour into me and said, absolutely not. If you're going to have a show, um, the show is going to open. And, and if you're re not ready, then, then there is no show. And that's under no conditions do you deserve. I just went on and on and on and on. So I was kind of burned uh, after that experience. And, but what was important is at the end of my year studying studio art, I said, I, I can't make art myself. I don't have the time to resurrect very rusty skills and, and to start the process all over again. And I was returning to work. I said, but, you know, I, I'm not wealthy. My husband is a scientist. I'm a public school teacher, but I can become a collector. And I can become a collector because, as you said, ceramics were a very reasonably priced um, art. And I said, that would be the way that I would support the arts. Now, back in those days, and that's the mid 70s, um, there was a, a store in Georgetown, this section of Washington, DC, uh, called Georgetown, and it was American Hand. And there were two guys who ran this, and they had the eye. They were unbelievably forward thinking and adventuresome and and supportive of ceramicists. And the ground level floor was their sort of classic retail shop. I mean, but it was the better end of ceramics, but it was retail. Downstairs was um, the basement, which was their gallery. And during the gallery season, once a month, they would feature, they would stage a show featuring a different artist. And the Saturday before the Sunday um, show, there would be a craft demonstration by the artist at what was then called Montgomery County, um, uh, Montgomery County Community College, okay? Uh, Lee Eagle of um, Craft Council Board fame, uh, I think underwrote the, this demonstration. And um, so we'd go on Saturday up to uh, Rockville, Maryland on the campus and, and see and, you know, learn about the ceramicists and, and their philosophy and watch them do some of the, um, the parts of the construction that were doable in a, a demonstration setting. Then came Sunday. Now, Sunday, I'm laughing. I'm laughing with such pleasure. The way it worked is we would drive to um, Wisconsin Avenue, right in front of, the, of American Hand. And 
we would get there hours and hours and hours before it opened. I don't remember if it was nine or 10, but just hours before it opened. We'd have newspapers with us, coffee drinkers would have coffee with them, whatever. And we'd sit there and we'd wait. We'd also notice who was, what cars were showing up. And very quickly, we began to associate specific faces with specific cars. So we knew the order in which we had all shown up in, in the middle of Oh Dark Hundred in Georgetown, Washington, DC. And um, when the doors opened to the gallery, we'd all troop downstairs and we'd line up in the order that we'd arrived on the street and we'd put our names down on the list. Then we'd have about 15 minutes to survey the work that was on display for sale. And one by one, they call our names and we would have 10 minutes to select two pieces for purchase. And when we had gone through all the names um, on the list, we were then, it was free for all and you could buy as many additional as you want. Well, I'm here to tell you that after that buildup, after you've gotten up in the pitch dark of night on a Sunday morning and driven some reasonable distances, you were buying. You were, you, it, it didn't matter whether you liked it, didn't like it. To some extent, you trusted. Um, Ed was the, the more uh, artistic end of the business. And it's been so long, I honestly don't remember his partner. If someone out there remembers, please tell me in the chat because I feel terrible, terrible. He ran the business end. And, and so you bought two. So for um, several years, I would buy two once a month um, during the, and I, I guess there'd be like six or eight um, shows through the, the, the gallery season. And this was not in the Rochester house. This was in a, a house in, in Virginia. And first we built a, um, a display case surrounding the um, fireplace. And I filled that up with these, again, totally unrelated pieces. It was literally anything I liked. And when that got filled up, we pulled the desk out of the niche and we built a display case filling that with ceramics. There were also shelves in the opening between the dining room and the living room. And that was filled with glass shelves. And then we filled up the foyer. There was, um, again, and we just kept, all right, at some point we literally ran out of space. But more significantly, everything looked terrible together because there was not enough of any one genre or one style or one shape. There was no cohesion. It was quite literally anything I liked. And I mean, I had fun. I had fun sitting there reading and looking around and seeing everything that I love. But I thought, this is, this is not going to continue and end well. So I decided um, that I needed to identify a focus. And it was actually pretty easy to um, choose teapots. Not that I had a particularly large number, just serendipitously. I had a Philip Cornelius that uh, I broke. Um, I had a French teapot um, that still exists here in, in Rochester. That Oh, yes, and the Steve Howell, the wildly exuberant. <laughs> so that was that. I had three teapots out of, you heard how many shelves I had, three teapots. So it was an act of, it was an, a, 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 a statement about the future, that I was going to give away everything I had collected, except the teapots, but that the future was going to be rosy and I was going to continue to love collecting teapots. And I have to point out to everyone who's assembled here that 
quite often people at museums, uh, I would say more often than not, when we get inquiries from collectors, uh, the collector has more like you know, a thousand objects or you know, some massive amount that's unmanageable. And you know, when I found out that your coll collection was really quite manicured and manageable, that was one of the things from the museum side that um, you know, made this relationship especially. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Um, it, it, it was never cam level. It was never 10,000, much less 1,000. But to me, again, from very a very modest sort of background, um, I thought it was a pretty impressive size collection. So, so um, I, I wanted to ask, you were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, being nudged into picking up pieces when you were having those Sunday morning knockdown drag out um, sort of competitions with other collectors. Are there any pieces that came to you in that way that um, you may not have been as attracted to initially that came to have sort of greater meaning? Uh, All of them basically. Okay. No, that's, that's overstating it. All of them came to have greater meaning, but there were definitely some that I enjoyed more than others. Um, and I can't, I remember Tom Coleman and I remember that I liked his um, uh, Celadon ash plates more than um, some of his um, abstract uh, designs on, on uh, things. And yet I bought one because I recognize um, the quality. And the, the longer I kept it, the more I grew to love it. Um, I can't remember. By the time I got rid of them, I loved them all. So it's hard to remember which ones, but I know that existed. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah. So I'm going to bring uh, Eric Saratella in in just a moment, but before we do that, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the unifying factors are for what attracts you to uh, teapots. It's been interesting getting to know you and uh, to pick your brains, and our, our tastes are actually quite different uh, in a lot of ways, but <laughs> they, they converge in other ways that are interesting too. So if you had to say what the most important quality that you look for uh, in a teapot, what, what would that quality be? It has to speak to me. Okay. It has to speak to me. And it has to speak to me directly. You know, I, I share this already um, with Kristen, you'll hear it in the tape. Um, yesterday, Garth and I were doing a technical run through. He was telling me biographical information about uh, one of the artists. I knew none of this. I knew absolutely none of this. And I was feeling really depressed because I thought, you know, I, I really put a lot of passion and energy into collecting these. And, and yet I knew none of these biographical issues and how they informed the end product. And to hear Garth explain it, it, it really did inform the end product. And, um, and, and so I, that was worrying me and bothering me all night. And I, it suddenly dawned on me, and I've shared this already with Garth. When I was an undergraduate, I was an English major. And the approach that we were taught to analyze literature was called um, um, new criticism. Well, it wasn't new then, and it certainly isn't new 50 years later. But it was to look at the words on the page only and not talk about biographical influences, not talk about historical or sociological influences, just the words on the page. Then moving forward, um, I thought, what is my favorite form of art? And it's abstract expressionism, which again, it's not who can paint the most realistic, recognizable tree, but it's literally paint on canvas. And I thought, you know, there's a through line here. The reason I like, um, have responded to teapots 
is because I just look at what is in front of my eyes and I react on a visceral level. And that's the through line. And it doesn't matter whether it's a little tiny Yixing teapot that's as big as my hand and it's so, the tolerances for the fit of the lid are so tight that a hair is all that fits between the lid and the body. Or it's these funky, crazy, loosey-goosey things. It just spoke to me. So I, I will say um, that you are a sucker for certain types of teapots and certain well, that's materials. True. That's and true. so uh, Celadon, I think, being one of them. So um, I have this incredible Elaine Coleman um, teapot, and it's a little bit blown out because of the um, light shining on it and the degree of the light shining on it. But um, before we turn to Eric, which Eric's work is definitely uh, the flip side of um, I think what attracts you. Um, can you just talk a little bit about Celadon and how Celadon speaks to you as a, as a collector? Okay, uh, you can see if, if you hold it a little bit closer, there is wonderful carving all over that. Okay, so the, um, the Coleman piece um, speaks to two of them, two of my absolute passions. One is Celadon. I am like nuts over Celadon. It can be the green yellow end of Celadon all the way to the very blue end of Celadon. I can't tell you how many Celadon pieces I have. But the other thing I adore about ceramics is the plasticity of clay. I love to see the hand of the maker. And because of the distortions um, uh, of the, the shape, um, I, I'm getting that, uh, the sense of what is the nature of, of play and how it can be pushed and pinched and depressed and it holds that shape. Um, to me, this is um, just, it has a wonderful, it recalls the Chinese, um, well, the Asian, the Asian, um, um, all the Asian historical pieces that you see in a museum, but this is as contemporary as it gets, so. And Elaine, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship between parts and whole, but uh, the, the softness of the way that Elaine interrelates all of these pieces. Uh, and by the way, Elaine was going to join us today, but um, she's having eye surgery today. So all of our best is going out to uh, yes. Elaine Coleman because she needs those eyes to be able to do this work. Um, but I love, look at the way that the uh, carving sort of grows into um, the handle here. This is an incredible piece. So, all right. uh, so, I love that piece. I want to go ahead and let's move to Eric's work, which is kind of a, a flip side of the coin. And this will be the starting point for this conversation. And can you talk about discovering um, Eric's work during this period? And we'll bring on uh, Eric in just a moment to kind of talk about this as a departure point. I'm going to tell it as I remember it. Eric, <laughs> you have some revisions to what I'm sharing. Rashomon. Um, um, there was a, a show company called uh, Sugarloaf Craft Productions, something like that, that had um, um, sponsored craft shows up and down the East Coast. And I think from Long, Long Island, maybe the Maryland area was the, the most southern point. I'm not sure. It was a perfectly charming place to go on a weekend. Um, it was a place where they always had good folk music. The food was very, very interesting. And um, they had very nice soap. Um, you, you notice that I'm not talking much about the ceramics. <laughs> Eric can chime in because it was not a place uh, where um, it was very 
brown and utilitarian and perfectly, perfectly fine. You know, balance was good. Feet were good. It was perfectly um, competent work, but it, it didn't excite me. And I'm walking down the aisle in one of the buildings and all of a sudden I see a booth. And I've been going now with Philip for many, many years and, and probably twice a year within a year. Uh, the, the November one, we'd always get um, uh, very nice soaps or, or leather goods for his secretaries. Okay, so I don't want to say it was loving hands at home. It was way better than that, but it wasn't museum potential. And I see this booth. And the quality was several orders of magnitude, to use a good scientific term, better than what Sugarloaf had ever had. And I went zooming in there. And the piece that you see here was typical of what was on display. And I got to talking with Eric and he explained that it was his opened earth series and that he would throw these pieces, wait until they were leather hard, make some cuts in them and using some pressure from the inside, distend them somewhat to, sit, to produce the cracks and stretches. Nod your head, Eric, I'm doing okay. <laughs> But, you know, I can't see the image for some reason. I don't have everybody up, so. Okay. Um, but okay. that's okay. You're doing, you got it. Okay. And, and it was just um, in a different way. It was, again, the, the interaction of the human hand on the clay and the, um, the resulting fissures and interesting things that were happening. And of course, um, I am very, very, very big into wood fired or anagama fired pieces because I deeply, deeply, deeply believe in the kiln gods. I, you don't know what's gonna happen in that fire. You have no idea that there's gonna be some glorious streak that appears, if there's gonna be a disaster. You, I, it just, you do not know, you can't, custom order, I would like this to happen in this location on this piece. You just trust it to the kiln gods. And so I, we talked, you showed me, is it Ceramics Monthly? The article with the, yeah, okay. Oh, the old brain still works. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you showed me the article about these and and I was thinking about buying, but then you started talking to me about a new direction that you were going, and that you were going in Trompe Lloyd. And you brought me, Let's see. an example of Trompe Lloyd. And it was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We all have to start somewhere. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey, you started. I never did. So, um, and and I, I will actually never forget. Um, Eric used to live in uh, Ithaca, and Ah Leon, A H L E O N, I think, um, who is a world class, amazing, amazing ceramicist, um, had come to. Cornell, only once I think at that point, although he came more than the once, and you started taking lessons with him. And the advice that he gave to you, perhaps when you showed him this exact piece that I am referring to, <laughs> how do I make better pots? And he said, make more pots, I believe was his answer. What, what it was, it actually predates that piece. Oh, I, oh. I had had a corporate career and I left it to become a potter, to be a, you know, a humble mug making potter. And I took these teapot workshops from Alion while he was at Cornell and didn't, it wasn't Trump lawyer or anything. It was more Yixing teapot based. 
And anyway, um, he and I sort of became fast friends. And the night before he went back to Taiwan, we had a party for him. And I was sitting out on the back deck talking to him. And at this point, I've been a professional, you know, professional potter for like six months. I've given up my day job, my company car. I'm sleeping in my van at Sugarloaf shows. And I thought, who better to ask about my career than this guy? So I said, hey, Alion, what's next for me as a potter? And he said, Eric, you need to make better pots. <laughs> and so that's when um, I kind of held him to it a little bit. And he arranged for me to do what ended up being two artist residencies in Taiwan. And so I went and lived there for almost five months the first time around. And when I came back, the first body of work was both Yixing teapots, unglazed Yixing style teapots, and the opened earth work, which is where you heat the outside of the clay and then push it from the inside out and it cracks open, um, which has got a long, long history, but this was, you know, I had a, my own interpretation of it. So that's where really then Karen, you came in and I, you know, sort of had changed kind of levels and styles of work at that point from, um, you know, from like the Sugarloaf standpoint that you were referring to. But we were, and then I, I'm a graduate of the University of Rochester and would go up every year to a big fall hoopty do called Meliora Weekend. And um, um, we left that day at Sugarloaf. I, I didn't buy anything. And, uh, but you said, you know, um, that you would get in touch with me when you thought your work was ready for me to see again. And more than a year passed and you got in touch with me and we met on the campus at the U of R. You loaded your car with boxes and boxes and boxes. Fucking Trump Loy out of the back of my van, right? <laughs> okay, and and you hauled it all there, and I had chosen three pieces: the piece that you just saw, uh, another opened earth piece, and a black one, a black lagoon, a clay one. Mm -hmm. And just just as you know, literally, I'm about to write you the check, and you took out a, your phone and you said, "I want to show you." a pot that I just dropped off at the Memorial Art Gallery gift shop. And it was a pine trunk loy teapot. I cannot communicate the depths of my, here it comes, here it comes. Oh, so let me make, let me pin, excitement. there we go. I said, to, to Eric, I'm, I'm not going to buy the Black Lagoon of Clay one because I must have, and I, do, I found out the price and it was like really a lot more than anything I had bought up till now, but I had to have it. I just, I was, I was irrational. <laughs> and but keep I, up in business. <laughs> and I called the gift shop and I said, please take that teapot off of your display, it is sold. And you separately in your car and I in my car drove, I don't know how long you took to get there, but I drove, I set a land speed record. <laughs> the campus of the university and the Memorial uh, Art Gallery to get to my teapot because I was buying it. It was, it was just no questions asked. And I fell in love. And this is um, uh, my first of, I, I now have, well, it's probably, I, what I'm about to say is probably not true anymore um, because your pieces have gotten so monumental that I really, they're, they're beyond what I can cope with. But I have A is a gift from you, one of your Yixing teapots which happens to be here in the house because in the excitement to get all the teapots to Everson, it didn't quite get packed, but it's getting there. <laughs> we see how you work, Karen. All right, all right. Um, the um, two open to earth teapots, this pine teapot that you'll see, and then um, a, an Asian style, um, 
This is my kimono teapot. Uh, this is, Eric was thinking about, because pine is the classic um, uh, bark that the- Classic Yixing, Yixing Chinese bark. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, well, here, you tell it. You tell this part of it, the switch to uh, birch. Well, you know, having, having studied both Yixing teapots and Trump Loy in, in Taiwan, you know, and or China, um, I wanted to, I wanted to just not be a, a knockoff of this art form. I mean, it was what I connected with. And so anyway, I wanted to kind of find my own voice in it. And one of the first ways to do that was to change surface texture. And so um, birch has always been my favorite tree. Uh, we always had them in, I've had them in every house that I've ever lived in, uh, except this one here in North Carolina. And they're, they're a little bit cathartic for me because my dad died when I was 10 and the house I remember him from was just filled with birch trees. It was outside of Albany, New York. And so they're kind of like angels of the forest to me. So I just felt like that was a good direction to go to at least start to, you know, become a rung in the ladder of, of Trump Loy and Yixing based work. Uh, but later I ended up changing more form wise, but that was really my first step of, of independence from my teachers and, and from the classic Chinese styles. So that was, that was the, re those are the reasons for Birch. And the, um, the first Birch one I got though, Eric's work has tended to be more literal, um, trees that look recognizably like trees, and then also the anthropomorphic and um, trees that look like sassy ladies and dancing ladies and, and all kinds of you know, humans with personality, but they are in fact recognizable as trees. And so the kimono one was my first foray into an anthropomorphic. Um, uh, the first one I saw, the one I saw at the Smithsonian, I remember it as life-size scale when you're my height. I mean, because I'm not very tall. Uh, to, to me, it felt like it was as tall as I am. Um, I, I, as I say, I, I don't have the space for any of that. So Eric um, made me a, a smaller one, and, and it, um, it dances and swirls, and it's just quite wonderful. Now I've mentioned Black Laguna clay a lot of times because there's a, an, a part, a little sort of asterisk to that. Um, one of the subcategories, uh, one of the approaches uh, was to do, start doing charred um, logs and the Black Laguna clay, my understanding is that that's where it's, you, you put it to use again. So although I did not have, end up with an open to earth black laguna. I ended up with a um, uh, the, the the teapot, um, the, the charred logs. And I think is that in the vitrine? I think that one is in the. Uh, vitrine. Yes, the charred one is in the vitrine. So it's on view uh, right now in a legacy of first the Everson collects. Yes. So um, when I gave my uh, request to the. Uh, Everson, I had one and only one um, requirement, and that was they had to take every single one of my serratellas because I have really a cross section of, of, at least up till then, all of your styles, and I did not want that broken up. Um, and okay. you're the you're the only one who who has that or who, who's had it. I mean, yeah, my scale has changed and some things have gotten more sculptural and they're not always teapots, but you know, that's really a minor change. I mean, as far as major, major styles, Yixing, opened earth, um, weathered and, and pine, charred, and of course birch, and then the anthropomorphic within that, you've, you've really got the whole genre, which is kind of cool. I mean, I've always sort I of brag so about, <laughs> brag, I brag on you about that. <laughs> Yeah, so we're very pleased to be able to have that within the museum and with your connections to Ithaca and central New York, you know, I think you've been a part of the Everson family, I think, for a long time. So yeah. I'm really happy about that. I, I brought, I, I grabbed a couple of images from your website, Eric, and um, I wanted to just wrap up our conversation with you uh, by showing some of these monumental pieces. 
um, one of which is uh, kind of an abstracted teapot and the other one is more literal, but kind of at this monumental scale. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get there. Okay, so uh, here's a photo of you working. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your studio process and um, how you would start to embark on, on a piece that's this uh, monumental? How, uh, how improvisational and how versus how planned uh, do you have to be? Um, it's, it's, I would say, 90% improvisational. I, I sometimes start with a sketch, and usually that sketch is old, so I'll have an idea and I'll make a rough sketch so that I remember it. Some of these pieces take several months to make, so I can't always just hop on what, what's in my mind. So that becomes a starting point, because I need to, at some point, either make a pot on the wheel or get a slab of clay to get started. And then the rest really becomes that proverbial dance that we clay people have with the clay. And so I work very um, intuitively and very kind of three-dimensionally. I've got stairs in my studio that I can go and look from above. So I'm working like a Michelangelo, right? 360 degrees. I look at every angle. I look at it from above in case it's in a museum and somebody's looking down over a balcony. So I'm continually working and tweaking the design. And then the details, um, the, the look that makes it look like wood, that also is, is really kind of an intuitive thing. I don't have any models or anything in the studio. I feel like if I just copied a log, it would be stiff and it, and it wouldn't really be art. It'd be good craftsmanship, which is part of the art, but the real art comes in from the story and the emotion that, that goes into it. So I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of uh, totally mindful and totally oblivious at the same time as I'm carving the details. It's just a matter of um, that zen-like zone. And when it's all said and done, it just ends up kind of looking like wood. So that's, that's the sort of the short story, start to finish. Before we talk about this next piece, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your gallery in New York City, which is the Jason Schock Gallery, which is one of the most distinctive galleries and certainly for art fairs one of the most distinctive spaces uh, in in any art fair but jason's history is with um starting out with 19th century late 19th century early 20th century european porcelains um can you talk a little bit about um your relationship with jason and the way that you fit into the kind of eccentric worldview that he has as a gallerist yeah, Jason is, um, you know, Jason's the real deal. The, the guy is just amazing. Um, incredible eye for artwork. And, and really, like you said, he made, his, he made his name in this French Art Nouveau um, clay work. And also, as a good business person, recognized the shift from kind of classic and antique work that was going on in the art world into more contemporary. So he made a decision to... to build a contemporary line along with his historic work. And he started with a guy named Gareth Mason, a UK potter. And I'm, I don't know what number I was, but I was his first American ceramicist. And what happened was he saw a teapot very similar to the jiving teapot that Karen has, the pine teapot in the Carnegie. And I got a, a one sentence email. Jason is very to the point as a business person. And I get this one sentence email that says, would you like, uh, would you like New York representation? And he's standing next to my teapot in the Carnegie. And I'm thinking, is this spam? You know, we are just get spammed a lot. And I'm like, is, what's going on with this? So I actually had to have him vetted because he wasn't a contemporary gallery. Well, I wasn't familiar with him. Anyway, he, I checked with some galleries that I knew and some collectors. He turned out to be the real deal. So I started with Jason and, and we've had since a relationship, uh, I guess we're going on eight years now. Um, and he's, he's just represented my work phenomenally. Um, he, he's the type of person that he's got to believe in the artwork and he's not going to rep it if he doesn't. So um, his, his heart's really in it, which I think is, is part of what makes a difference for him as a gallerist. Uh, and he really cares about his artists. Like he really wants to see them succeed and be a part of their career. So um, anyway, that's how, that's kind of how I started my relationship with Jason. And it continues this day to, to just be phenomenal. 
and Jason is sort of known to a lot of people here at the Everson because we just hosted Gareth Mason for an extended mm -hmm. residency and wrapped up an exhibition. So it's interesting to see the different sides of the Jason Jacques coin. Um, so I yeah, just, no, very eclectic in his in his style and and tends to actually be bright. I don't I don't always sort of fit within that. Other than his focus is uh, is on quality and message and design. So he's he's not repping me because it looks like wood. He's repping me because of the design of the work. Amazing. So I have an image here up on the screen of one of your mon monumental pieces. I believe this is over three feet tall. Yes. Uh, you still, uh, in your work, even when you're working monumentally, take cues from vessels and uh, teapots. Can you talk a little bit about that scaling up and scaling down of your uh, process and how teapots still continue to inform your work to this day? Right. So, and this one is a teapot. So that piece that juts out to the right, if you're looking at the screen, is the spout. You can see the handle to the left and then up at the top is hollow and there's a piece that pulls out and that's actually the lid. And I, I think it comes from, from two places. One is I really started as a production potter. Right? I took a pottery class, fell in love with clay, evolved into becoming a production potter. And that's when I met Alion, as I talked about earlier. So my mind from a, a clay and an art standpoint is just always based in, um, in functional form, even if it's not truly functional. And then the second part of that is because I trained in the I Ching tradition and, and made burnished Yixing style teapots with the tight lids and, and all of that. Um, the first Trump Loy and ceramics was done in the 1600s in Yixing when they started to make teapots look like pine and, and other wood and gourds and things like that to integrate nature into the tea ceremony. So it kind of became a way to honor um, both my history as a functional potter, whether it's a teapot or a bowl or whatever, uh, and also honor the history of Trump Loy and clay. So the, the two of them really sort of inform, I would say the bulk of my work. Do you have any upcoming projects or uh, do you have things that you're planning with Jason that you'd like to put in a plug for? Uh, put in a plug. I actually have two international shows that we're, we're working on, but quite honestly, with, with COVID, everything is so on hold that um, I don't have that much to plug. He did just open a spring show at the gallery. Um, I know there's, that's all of his artists, so they'll be working that. I can give a plug on that, and, and that would be jasonjock.com is his website um, for information on that. So hopefully we'll have some really good stuff coming up as soon as um, things kind of start to open. Awesome. Well, Eric, we miss you here in central New York, and we look forward yeah. to a visit from you at some point when things open back up. I would let you know how much I love the Everson. So thanks for including me here. And, and Karen, thank you so much for being such an uh, amazing collector and friend. And friend. Feeling is entirely mutual. <laughs> All right, so um, I want to show a couple of more teapots on my end and talk with Karen, and we might have another special guest out there in the audience. If you're available, Kevin Snipes, and want to turn on your um, computer, I'll let you chime in as well. Uh, that conversation that Karen and I taped with Krista Assad, um, I think I'm going to make it available as bonus content. We, we <laughs> let about 10 minutes go when we were trying to uh, reorganize things after being hacked. And again, I apologize for that, but uh, this will be the first ever uh, Everson Object Study uh, bonus content. And thanks, Karen, for helping me tape that conversation with Krista earlier. Um, so I'm going to bring out this Kevin Snipes pot, which I was so tickled to be able to have this in the collection. And it has been on fairly constant view since I um, got here as curator. And Kevin is someone that um, I have worked with as a curator several times, I actually had the pleasure of commissioning him for a pot when I was editing an issue of Studio Potter magazine, but that's a different story. Um, but he's someone whose work that I absolutely love. And um, here is this porcelain teapot. And Kevin really works with figuration uh, when it comes to the vessel. So he's playing on this long tradition of putting figures into uh, his vessels that then have to interact. And it's great that Kevin's, um, Kevin's uh, uh, people on his pots are sort of always looking. They're looking around corners. They're looking at each other. 
Um, there is desire, there's thwarting of desire. Um, this particular piece, uh, Karen, can you, you, you remember what the uh, male uh, is saying on- The, on the male this? is saying, come to me uh, in, in this bubble, this dialogue bubble, uh, in where basically where the heart um, should be, it, there is a little heart that is drawn. So there's some suggestion of a love relationship, whether it's unrequited love, whether it is love that he has an expectation that the female on the other side will indeed come in. It's like proposing in a public place, you hope she's going to say yes. Um, he is counting down. So you can see that uh, on one side of the pod, it says 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 1. So that's an interesting uh, um, layer. And I will say that Kevin likes to leave things open to interpretation by his audience and likes to leave um, gray areas there. Hello. And I, this, this, oh, hey, hi. Kevin. All right, so we have Kevin on the line. So uh, uh, Kevin, you can, again, correct us if any of our uh, assumptions are wrong, but we just had a great conversation about no, that, the stuff. I've been, weeks ago. been listening. I'm sitting outside and uh, there's a lot of birds behind me that might be distracting. Ah, they're welcome. I, I, we're enjoying having them uh, in the conversation today. One thing also that I'll point out um, is that uh, it's interesting that there are all of these layers of sort of communication and playing with language that Kevin engages in. Uh, and there's a little speech balloon here that has some text that has been sort of X'd out um, here. Uh, so, um, you know, coded messages or uh, communication that's indirect and not necessarily um, connecting, I guess, as I put on my curator brain. Uh, Kevin, would you like to speak to the ways that you like to play with language and text on your pieces? Sure. So um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is um, coded messages, like you said, but the idea of communicating and miscommunicating. And I think that um, a lot of this research or investigation stems from being an African American and often having felt um, misunderstood um, or being looked at as an other and um, not really wanting to make work that was um, necessarily about um, just sort of uh, African-American experiences, but wanting to really dig deeper under that concept and to what does it mean to be an other. So on, on my pieces, I typically, um, I, I started hand building specifically to frame each of the figures so that they are on opposite sides of the piece and create that tension between the two sides. So, you know, their eyes are glancing sideways. Um, they're referring to each other, even though they can't see each other. So there's that distance of the vessel that's between the two. So that's kind of the basic setup. And then there's always some um, sort of Thing where one person says something, but you're not quite sure if they mean something good or something bad, all those sort of things. Are you an overthinker? Do you, uh, um, Over do, you do you let things swirl in your head and uh, definitely um, <laughs> <laughs> something we share? Um, can you can can you talk a little bit about the teapot? I mean, this is a wildly inventive teapot that, if you are um, tuning in, you can see that these holes are pierced all the way through uh, this form. And there's basically a little straw that is attaching the body of the teapot to the, this is a, sort of a magic teapot in a way. It has a sure. spout uh, and the, it's a little like a, an English puzzle jug uh, in a certain way. Um, can you talk about um, that negation of the implied negation of the pot? Yeah, so um, I, I just turned off the video. Will, okay. will the, the image, will your image just be there if I- Yeah, I can pin my video here and let you uh, okay. narrate. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's a secret passage teapot. And what that means is that there's actually a passageway that goes through that hold part and it, the teapot can actually pour if you really want it to. And, the, you know, like everything stems from this idea of the 
relationship. So the idea of the secret passage is not about the physical teapot. It's more about the emotional relationship between the two people, that there's this passageway between the two people. And a lot of times I think of, um, you know, I, I make things that are, are, that play with the idea of function. You know, the function here is not the function of a teapot. That's not the important thing. The important thing is the, the, the transference of not tea, but of energy and emotions and intellect. So I'm playing with the idea that the teapot is almost like a, a um, alchemical vessel where mm. you put something in and then something passes through and comes out the other end. But it's more about emotions and intellect. Um, yeah, so I, I do think a lot. <laughs> Aaron, I'll, I'll call on you. You know, you lived with this teapot for uh, um, many years, and uh, um, can you talk a little bit about your attraction to this teapot, which is very different from kind of the vast majority of pots in your collection, but um, there is something that called out to you. Yes, um, I was uh, uh, surface decoration was something that I only eventually came to appreciate. Um, that I, I really was focusing a lot on form and the perfect shape and the perfect glaze. And even if the perfect glaze was kind of a very personalized definition of perfect. I mean, um, if you can hold up the, uh, the Krista teapot for a second, you'll see what I mean by that. And yes. Kevin's picture is pinned in the center, but we yep. people could see. You turn it so that the two blue the two blue streaks are showing on the audience. Okay, so okay. okay. Can you make that? Can you make your own? image the big one by any chance? It should be the big one for everybody. Oh, now it is, now it is. Yeah. Okay, so can you see there are two streaks of blue? Something happened, again, in the kiln, nothing that anyone can control that um, caused the, the glaze to make those two beautiful streaks. And if you look at the front, the point at uh, the sharp end of the teapot, you can turn it around the other way. Right there, you may be able to see, yeah, the crystal, and you can begin to see the crystal glaze formation that's that's there and how the glaze is pulling away from the sharp edge. Okay, so those historically were what I was drawn to, a lot about the serendipitous um, things that happen in the fire. And Kevin's was the first teapot that when I saw the, um, the images on it, I just fell madly in love. <laughs> I, I felt a sense of play. I felt a sense of discovery, not quite understanding what it was that I was looking at, but intrigued by it. Absolutely loving the pierced holes because that seemed to there's a real big fight between the teapot purists who say that the only teapots you can collect are teapots that are functional. And the group in which I belong is if it's got a spout, it's got a handle, I declare it to be legitimate teapot material. And so without, it took me a while, frankly, to even discover there was the secret channel. I thought literally it was a non-functional teapot. Apologies, Kevin, what can I say? I was so focused on the surface decoration that I never got in looking inside the pierced front there. So and this is the, oh, go ahead, Karen, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, you, you, I can pick up. So if we are actually gonna have to kind of wrap things up, but I think that we've kind of arrived at the perfect point and we've act, we didn't really, we didn't really plan things out like this, but this is like, uh, a really great reveal at the end. Uh, this is like the the end of the usual suspects. And uh, um, so out of all of the teapots that I've shown today, Karen, uh, 
how many of these have you had tea out of? Ah, <laughs> you know the answer, and you were, you deliberately decided to embarrass me. None. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's embarrassing at all. Uh, okay. um, and in fact, from the mu museological side, uh, the fact that uh, these teapots, you know, are sort of unused, I think is something that um, makes things a little bit easier on our end. Uh, Karen is the single best art handler that I have ever encountered in my life. Uh, she, she definitely like missed her calling in a certain way and all of these pots arrived to the Everson immaculately packed and not, not a chip or ding uh, in any of them. Um, but, uh, you know, Karen, you are a tea drinker and I think, you know, we, we both share that. I have a teapot or two in my life that, I, that are the functional teapots and I'm constantly drinking out of handmade things, but I have many a teapot in my collection that I have never um, sort of had tea from. Although I do sometimes get some pleasure out of putting tea in the otherly functional uh, teapots. Well, I bought a teapot, believe it or not, with the express purpose of putting tea in it. And for one reason of, or another, it was um, an ash blaze. And um, for one reason or another, I, I never brewed tea. And I bought it from um, oh, Texas guy. Sorry. Um, and um, the um, one year later, and I bought it at, um, well, I call it winter market, the ACC's Baltimore winter. Okay. That's its whole form. Um, and uh, one year later, he was there again, and he had now a, a much larger teapot with the same glaze. And the reason that I had loved the glaze is it went in huge sheets down the side of the teapot rather than the usual rivulets that I associate with um, ash glaze. And, and this was, I think it was oak. And he showed me the handle. And this handle had a little streak of lavender in it. Mm. And you may recall that, you know, earlier I talked about things happen in the fire. Well, this guy didn't add a drop of lavender commercial glaze on the handle just to make it that way. Something happened, whether the the glaze had changed chemically in the year that it had been first formulated or what, but it had this streak of lavender. So I bought the second teapot only now because it was now a sort of demonstration of the effect of time on glaze chemical changes. I, there went the functional teapot that I had been willing to use. And now, if I want tea, I take a, an aluminum pot, heat up a cup of water, and make my tea that way. So it's Amen. probably never be. So uh, in wrapping things up from the Everson side, uh, I want to point out that since I arrived here close to two years ago, uh, at least some of Karen's collection has been on view in some exhibition somewhere. And right now there are multiple exhibitions that have Karen's pieces in them. So when you come to the Everson, you'll be able to experience her pots. And then when, when we open up our cafe, um, in, we are going to gradually open our cafe thanks to COVID-19, but we are gonna start with coffee and tea probably later this fall. And I wanna say that uh, you know, our cafe is going to be built around a collection of functional pots that you, the, the visitor, can, can actually use. So these come from the collector Louise Rosenfield, and she's a great um, pottery collector herself, but these are for use in the cafe. So we are hoping to have a selection of teapots that will have curated tea blends that are specific to that pot that you'll be able to, uh, just like when you went to the American Hand and uh, had to compete for being the first person to get those pots, Karen. 
if you want your tea blend in your teapot, you'll have to show up on time uh, to get that pot here at the university. Okay. So look for our evolving cafe project, which will begin its opening uh, in the fall. Um, Karen, I want to thank you for um, joining us today. Eric, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and Kevin as well. And please uh, stay tuned to our social media, and I will put up the bonus Krista Asad uh, episode as well. Join us for the auction preview for the Surf Plus auction. Uh, the auction actually begins tonight at 6 p.m. Um, you can find information on my personal social media and look for it on the Everson social media. The preview party will be next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then I'll be getting up the next day and celebrating the end of um, Pride Month by talking about uh, the ceramicist um, Sasha Brastoff. And that will be a lively, amazing um, conversation. Sasha Brastoff um, was a drag performer even while he was serving in World War II when he, he performed as Carmen Miranda. And after he got out of the army, he actually became Carmen Miranda's costume designer before becoming a well-known ceramic artist and designer in the Los Angeles area. So that will be this next week, same time, same place, and we will keep the hijackers from hijacking it, um, and we will have our amazing programming. All right, so Karen. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, uh, um, thank you to Eric and uh, um, Kevin as well, and for everyone who tuned in. All right, cheers, everybody. We will stick around and keep the camera on if you want to say hi to Karen or say hi to me or um, Eric or any of the other artists. Um, uh, but I will stop the recording now. And uh, again, all of these um, recordings are archived. You can find them on the Everson page, and you can also find them on our Facebook page as well. Here you go. <laughs>